in room 137 of the Edison Building. Present at the board table is Mr. Michael Munoz, Superintendent of Schools, and a non-voting ex officio member of the board. Also present is Ms. Wendy Edgar, the Assistant Board Clerk. Ms. Edgar, would you please call the roll? Mr. Barlow? Here. Mrs. Becker? Here. Chair Marvin? Here. Mr. Susner? Here. Ms. Sealinger? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. Workman? Here. Let's stand as we're able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 2.01, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, uh, fall in addition to the agenda, item 7.11, closed session expulsion, and item 7.12, expulsion of student B18. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is approved. 3.01, above and beyond, Mr. Munoz. Right. At this time, we'd like to recognize the November above and award above above, above and beyond winners. <laughs> Sorry, uh, and give you a couple three examples. Uh, the first one is from uh, TJ and Moon, are the custodians at Sunset Terrace. Uh, TJ and Moon, since 1999, have shown up for work with minimal days off. They come to work with great attitudes and willingness to help anyone. They treat staff and children with tons of respect and kindness. These two also show what it means to be a prideful worker with how their areas have looked since the day they were hired, always going above and beyond what is expected of them and always willing to lead, lend the, help their hand to those who are in need. If anyone deserves this recognition, these two do for their years of dedicated and committed service to Sunset Terrace. The next one is uh, Deb from Sentry. I'm impressed with the countless hours Deb has put into Century High School theater program and for incredible commitment she has shown in making that program meaningful, high quality, fun, and open to an incredible diverse group of students. A place where all kinds of kids found a home, found success, and found a place to contribute. This kind of inclusion is no small accomplishment and does not happen by accident. And the third one is recognizing Peg Harms uh, works in the insurance department. I appreciate Peg. I appreciate that Peg is always very kind and happy to help me with my insurance questions, even on the last day of open enrollment. She <laughs> deserves special recognition for her above and beyond service. So congratulations, all November winners. Thank you. And I see Ms. Amundsen, Amundsen is coming oh. up for a drawing. Yes. Uh, this will be my last, last time as president of RPSF, and we'll have somebody else doing it from now on. Um, but it's very exciting to be able to honor our above and beyond recipients in this way. We draw one name to receive a $25 gift card from Pasquale's Pizza um, because one of our missions is to support the staff, and this is a great way to do it. So we draw them. Uh, our winner is Toby Tyler from Century. Taylor. Toby. Taylor. Thank you. 3.02 equity update, Mr. Munoz. Yes, uh, we had students from the John Marshall Equity Council scheduled for this event. Uh, however, uh, one of them uh, became sick and another um, was not able to get off work, so I think we are going to reschedule them and we'll bring them at a, a future meeting. Thank you. I know that they, they do some great work and it'll be wonderful to hear from them. 3.03, .03, School Board Committee Assignments Update. Do any board members have reports they'd like to give on work they've done in the last couple weeks? Mr. Schlusner. 
it's not really a committee, but it was <clears throat> an update nonetheless. Had the first leg of the robotics tournament this weekend, and the Rochester teams from Washington and Lincoln did extremely well. Yeah, very proud of how they did. Thank you. Ms. Selinger. Um, thank you. I have several. Um, Director Workman and I attended the AMSD conference um, at the end of November. Uh, AMSD is our Association of Metropolitan School Districts that we are uh, part of up in the cities. Um, it was their little conference uh, they have yearly. We heard from uh, Tom Melcher, who is, uh, I don't know what we call him, but the guru of all things school finance in the state. Um, one of those people that can never retire because we won't know what the heck we're talking about if he's gone. Um, the big takeaway that, that I found in my notes was uh, since uh, 2023, 2003, uh, I haven't seen that number for a while, um, there's been a 9% reduction in our education funding and um, that's one of the reasons why we uh, talk about funding so much and have uh, difficult conversations about what we're funding and how to fund it. Uh, we also had a presentation on special ed funding uh, we talk a lot about the cross-subsidy, which is the, uh, the dollar amount that uh, comes out of our general fund to support our special ed funding. Um, most districts in the state are facing that um, problem, uh, so that was some good information. And then we had our own John Carlson and Chris Davidson from Longfellow presenting on our 4515 <laughs> schedule um, and the uh, benefits to our students and the costs, and they did an excellent job, and we were uh, proud to be represented at AMSD. Uh, also attended the wellness committee, a relatively new committee. Um, some interesting things about our wellness policy and how that re relates to the USDA. Um, we'll be doing some uh, assessment. Uh, every three years they do an assessment, so we'll be looking at that in the coming year. Um, talked a lot about the use of food as rewards for behavior. Uh, there's some concerns from parents about that. Um, and also birthday tweet, treats and equity issues. And so uh, good committee, a lot of good conversation there. Um, I will keep you posted on those items. And then I will take two items off the family engagement. Um, Dr. Marvin may have some more. Um, from the family engagement meeting this morning, um, uh, some of the report outs that were really interesting was uh, Martine, our, one of our equity specialists, talked about some students she was working with at Gage playing chess and how um, watching them play chess she could see the strategic thinking and some of the other things that kind of are in our graduate profile appear just watching this chess game, which was, um, which was a really interesting perspective to hear from her. Um, and then uh, Riverside, I'm pretty sure it was Riverside, had 143 students attend their dental clinic uh, that came. So we know that dental health is really important to our students. No one likes to um, work, concentrate, play with a toothache. And so um, I think that's a great service that we can provide our uh, students there. <clears throat> Thank you. Other, yes, Ms. Workman. Um, so I attended um, the delegate assembly for MSBA, uh, MSBA on November 30th and December 1st, which was recent and there is a summary on the MSBA uh, website 2019 legislative agenda but I will um, highlight a few of those which Director Seelinger has already touched on from her report on AMSD. Um, of the 22 resolutions that were brought forward six of them related directly to special education and the upshot of that is that um, the state of Minnesota needs to fully fund the cross subsidy for special education and that it will be one of their big um, initiatives mo moving forward for the 2019 session. Um, I think the one thing that struck me was that it's very unusual to have a, have a unison yes vote on any item and that was to adopt one predictable and equitable special education formula and this is from representatives from across the state of Minnesota. So it's not just a big city issue, it's an issue everywhere. A few of the other interesting ones uh, was the renewable energy and energy storage systems, which they wanted to have a um, rewrite of that statute because right now it only talks about wind energy and not all of the other renewable energy sources that are available. Um, there was a proposal for the allowable pay for school board members to go from 8000 to 
$10,977 per year, and that is adjusted for inflation. There was some interesting discussion on that because some people were thinking that this is what school board members are paid, and that was not the issue. The issue was how much they could earn as being a part-time employee of the school district, substitute teaching, coaching, and so on. Um, and then the final one um, that I will address briefly is to align the Minnesota special education statutes and rules with federal law. There's a lot of detail that you can find online about this particular one. Um, my concern, and I had a conversation with um, our student support services director, Carl Bolison, back in July to make sure that any of the alignment that we did, which would reduce the Minnesota um, requirements right now would not negatively impact our students in the classroom and that was the case so that that one also passed with a great deal of support so if you want to talk to me about any of the other 19 I would be perfectly happy to do it but probably since Dr. Marvin's given me a little bit of the stink eye we can do it at another time not during this session. And just to be clear, that was not a little bit of stink eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think Dawn was in She to was like kicking you too. It. Okay, thank you. Other reports? Yes, I received uh, a letter from the Minnesota School Board Association and the Minnesota School Board Association Awards Program includes a category of recognizing those persons who complete 300 or more hours of attendance at MSBA or NSBA sponsored meetings and activities and I was informed that we had two board members uh, that received the attained the president's award for the 2018-19 and that's director uh, Barlow and director workman thank you other reports I have one recognition uh, we have two school board members who will be leaving the board after this meeting. I would ask please at this time for Ann Becker and Gary Smith to stand. I command you to stand. <laughs> Both Ann and Gary have served two terms, that's eight years. They, in those years, they have brought in a really important energy, experience, and perspective to the board. They have both served as board chair. Uh, they have been invaluable board members and uh, their service has been highly respected. Your absence will be notable. Uh, we will miss you. We thank you for your work and we want you to know that if you're ever, if you ever find yourself on a Tuesday night with nothing to do, um, we will be here and likely there will be seats open so you're always welcome back. <laughs> And in recognition of your service, we'd like to um, give you these plaques. Yeah, I would also like to uh, thank Gary and Ann for your service to our district and I appreciate uh, almost seven and a half years ago you took a chance on me and hired me to be superintendent to this district so I, I appreciate that very much and um, I, I think uh, being a board member is probably one of the most challenging boards you could be on as in, in a community and uh, it's not like you get paid a lot of money to do this so I appreciate it and, and your time and commitment to our district and to our students so thank you and Ms. Becker Mr. Smith are there anything Anything you'd like to say? I'm assuming you've prepared speeches. Yeah, we prepared, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know I, I really talk a lot so at these <laughs> meetings all the time, so yeah. I, uh, no, I, um, it's, it's been a really good experience and to you two in the back, you'll also have a uh, good experience, I know, and, and would also like to thank you, Mike, for taking a chance on us because it's not like, I mean, it was pretty, <laughs> You know, pretty new group that that I guess you know, so everyone was was taking a leap of faith, and I think we all turned out pretty well. So, thank you. Time flies when you have fun. So, eight years uh, doesn't it seems like yesterday, but um, yeah. I'm sure uh, those who follow will will will, will do well, and uh, district's in good hands, and uh, look forward to watching the meetings on TV. 
<laughs> if there's anything interesting going on. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know. Thank you again. Thank, but thank you. 4.0 consent agenda. Are there any items here that you wish to be pulled for separate consideration? Ms. Workman? Um, let's see, the number is, it's the world's best workforce. 4.05. Thank you. Move approval for all items except. Except 4.05. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve all items except 4.05. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 4.05, Ms. Workman. Um, I, re I realize we've had uh, a, a changing in the guard, so to speak, um, between uh, Ms. Gibson and Ms. Witchman, who are serving, who have, have served and are serving as the um, director of curriculum and instruction. Um, I was a little bit disappointed in the fact that we did not receive some of the information that we have in previous years, specifically um, the MDE template that had been um, included in the past with the presentation. And I was a little bit taken aback when we are now being asked to approve an item which did not have this included as it had been included in previous years. Um, in a note that I received, email that I received from the superintendent last night, he said that we don't need to approve it. However, if that were the case, then I would really like to see that as an information item moving forward, as opposed to a briefing item, which then has to either be voted up or down. Um, some other improvements that I think we should work on for next year are um, The um, meetings that are required by MDE in terms of having an advisory committee, um, which seem to fall a little bit short this year. I did do some, a little bit of research concerning um, previous curriculum and instruction meetings where this was to have been accomplished. I realize it's hard to get people to serve on this committee, but it is an important part of the requirement by the Minnesota Department of Education, which also requires that we have a separate meeting to review um, the plan that has been presented with some suggestions from whatever um, the advisory team might recommend moving forward, which might be nothing. But I realize it's kind of too late to redo anything for this year. I'm not proposing that, but I would like us to take a little bit more care next year when we are looking at this again. Uh, duly noted, uh, by law, that isn't required to come to the board for approval, which is something that we've always done. Uh, the requirement is that we have to hold a public meeting to give an update on the progress, which we've, like many districts, have used the school board meeting, which is a public meeting, to do that. Um, we're more than happy to bring it as an information item, and we would be more than happy to entertain any suggestions board members have on uh, how do we can get more people to attend those meetings? Um, and I don't think that's not the only group that's having trouble getting people to come to meetings. Uh, that's why we thought we would partner with the Family Engagement Committee because that seems to be the only committee in our district that gets uh, a lot of attendance. So we thought that would be a great opportunity moving forward to, to get input. But um, we're open to suggestions on how we can get more people to come to uh, that group. And that is something that uh, talking to other superintendents struggle with the same thing that, that we are struggling with. I know that um, according to the MDE site, it says school boards are to hold an annual public meeting to communicate plans for the upcoming school year based on a review of goals, outcomes, and strengths from the previous year stakeholders should be meaning, meaningfully involved and this meeting is to occur separately from a regularly scheduled board meeting. So my recommendation for some of these things, if, if, if they are impediments to us getting the work done, that there, that should be taken up um, with MDE and or the legislature in terms of how useful are their requirements for us to actually put this plan into um, 
into place for the benefit of our students in moving forward. So um, I think it would, I would certainly be happy to go through this particular form. I've gone through the statute several times, but to work on that for next year and if necessary to put some kind of a group together with recommendations to the Department of Education about how we might be able to do this uh, more efficiently and effectively for our students. Any other discussion? Hey, Ms. Workman, I've, I've noted your, uh, your comments here. Are we ready to pass item 4.05? Okay. It's been moved and seconded to um, pass item 4.05. Any discussion? Do you have to read the resolution? Pardon? Do you have to read the resolution? Yes. Yes. Be it resolved, the school. Thank you. Be it resolved, the school board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the world's best workforce plan summary as presented. It has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Ms. Workman. Yeah, one more thing that I think would be helpful, since um, the board did get the information about this, the template that was that was filled out, but um, that wasn't included on the work on 4.05 tonight obviously because it's part of this, the consent agenda and um, I believe it will be posted or has been posted on the district mm -hmm. website at some point Mr. Munoz is that correct? Yes as I uh, communicated in my email that once we get the link to our website it will be added to that document before it's sent to MDE and we did communicate with MDE on this matter as well. Thank you all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion. Okay. Thank you. Motion um, is passed. Mr. Munoz. Yes, we have one retirement. Cheryl Huey is a student nutrition services associate at Rochester Alternative Learning Center. Uh, her retirement is effective at the end of the day, December 21st. And she has been with the district for seven years. So we thank her for her service to our district. Thank you. 5.01, approval of qualitative research study related to climate and culture and teacher self-efficacy at Pinewood Elementary School. This is a briefing item. Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time, I'm going to have uh, Brenda, Executive Director of CNI, come forward. And also, um, the two of you want to join her as well? Just <laughs> sit in front of one of the microphones so we can pick you up. And I'm assuming that's on here somewhere. So um, you have the, their documents in the board packet, but I want to introduce Dr. Brian Matera and Dr. <coughs> Don castagno Dysart um, to present this research proposal. This is official. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, our research study is looking at the relationship between school climate and culture and the impact on teacher self-efficacy. And we would like to do this study at Pinewood Elementary School. Um, so as we said, we're studying the climate and culture at Pinewood Elementary School. Um, when we are looking at school climate, school climate impacts everyone in the school community. So within Pinewood Elementary, that's the school community that we're looking at. Um, it increases teacher retention. So when you have a positive school climate and school culture, you're going to see increases in teacher retention. And it also um, increases job satisfaction among the staff. Um, for this study, we are just focusing on teacher um, and their sense of self-efficacy. With the climate and culture, we are not looking at um, students involved with the climate and culture. When we think of school culture, our definition of school culture is the character and quality of the school and teacher self-efficacy is a teacher's judgment of his or her own um, capabilities and so when we did our research we know that there have been studies done on school climate culture and those have looked at um, increases in job satisfaction increases in um, teacher self-efficacy but they haven't looked at the extent 
to teacher self-efficacy. And so that's what we're wanting to look at with our study, is the extent to teacher self-efficacy, as well as um, the growth mindset in learning opportunities, and also collaboration among teachers. So that's what we would like to focus our study on. I know. <laughs> okay. So with uh, this study, there's going to be three driving research questions that we'd really like to focus our work on. Number one is the connection between school climate and culture and teacher self-efficacy and how um, school climate and culture are, relates to that self-efficacy of, of a teacher. Number two, what perceptions of a teacher exist at Pinewood within uh, that specific building and how is that perception related to school climate and culture? And then number three, how does teacher self-efficacy impact the growth of a teacher and their willingness to implement best instructional practices? So those are our three driving questions. We want to learn about those questions throughout our work uh, within the study. Um, and then the next slide talks about how we're going to get answers to those, those research questions. And we have three different data gathering devices that we would like to move forward with. The first being surveys. And so we would like to implement a survey of 30 multiple choice questions to the individual participants within the study. Um, and those multiple choice questions will have answers such as strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. And within that, within that survey, teachers will complete uh, that survey instrument individually uh, for, for uh, securing confidentiality. The second piece is interviews. So we'd like to sit down with the individual teachers in the study and conduct a recorded interview um, with the participants that consists of 12 questions. And we're thinking that each individual interview will be about 30 minutes in length. And then finally, the uh, last uh, data gathering um, piece to this is in-class observations. So we would like to uh, commit our time to going into classrooms and conducting three in-class observations with each individual participant um, of 60 minutes uh, per teacher. Um, so once we have uh, gathered our data, of course the data analysis will begin. We are going to be doing um, open coding, so it's inductive, um, to determine the patterns within the data. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here. Um, these patterns will lead to categories and then um, subcategories, which then result in the themes, which we will then, of course, will publish. So. Um, like I said, we're, we're very, I'm very much inductive researcher, so we will be using inductive research to find those themes to present. And lastly, of course, what you probably are most interested in, what are the benefits to Rochester Public Schools? Um, so as a result of the findings within the study, um, the impact of teacher growth and effectiveness connected to implementing new best practices will re be revealed. Um, and so what we're hoping is those best practices that we find that are being used at Pinewood can then be replicated across the district at other schools. Because that's really what you want to do. And at this point, we'll, we'll certainly take any questions that you might have or comments. Ms. Becker. Um, so how did you choose Pinewood? So um, two years ago I was the district literacy specialist here in Rochester Public Schools and um, I did quite a bit of work at Pinewood. They were the first school to ask me will you come and model for us the new literacy curriculum right away at um, the data retreat. Um, I went in, I, I, they followed me around, watched me confer, they wanted me to right away, you know, show them how this worked. They asked me to come back. They asked me to do PD for them. 
Um, and so I noticed that there was this climate there and culture there already of what can we do to better ourselves? What are the things that, you know, that we can do to improve our practice? Um, so then when I decided that I was going to pilot writing workshop, the units of study, which the district was supposed to get the next year, uh, I went to those teachers because one of the teachers there had asked me about writing workshop previously and said, would you be willing to pilot this with me? And she said yes. And so I asked another teacher so I could get an intermediate and a primary, and they both jumped right on board. So, um, and I saw some other practices going on there about, you know, book studies and things where they were wanting to constantly improve themselves. And also, they, again, were the the Earl of School right away. They, you know, they were piloting that when it came to the district. So there's a climate and culture there where, as a school already, I noticed that there are things going on that I thought needed to be studied so that they can be replicated at other schools. Other questions? Mr. Barlow. Uh, thank you for including the questions that uh, yes. will uh, be asked. And um, we recently were introduced to the concept of uh, a particular school um, envisioning itself as a destination school and uh, we I think as a board would want each of our schools to be viewed that way and uh, so uh, is it your opinion or belief that uh, it begins with uh, staff and if so then is there any intent or desire to mine down uh, beneath that level perhaps uh, parents uh, students because one thing we have heard regarding some of the neighborhood schools and the passion that is present is the involvement of the parents and uh, the sense of home in regards to the children uh, so is that lost or is that yet to be uh, <coughs> revealed sure Great, great question. I think in the parameters of this specific study, um, we're focusing on teachers and staff. However, you bring up a great point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think as we move forward, perhaps, you know, down the road a bit, that we could certainly um, include other stakeholders in, in the study, in a study, um, to, to broaden our lens a bit. Um, but I think a staff really builds a school. Um, I think a staff uh, really upholds a school along with uh, a, a great administrative staff as well. Uh, but for the, the contents of this specific study, it's focusing on, on teachers at this time. And then finally, um, I did notice that uh, Principal Ewing has already mm -hmm. basically signed off. And uh, um, can I assume, Brenda, that in that you are presenting this on behalf of that uh, the district as well uh, fully accepts and stands behind this uh, research effort? Well, I think we're always we're always open to uh, research that's going to help us uh, better serve our students. So that's kind of our hope here that they'll learn something that um, they'll pass on to us that we can um, expand across the district. So. Uh, I'm assuming that this is um, teach voluntary for teachers to participate mm -hmm. and we're not going to make them participate. So, um, you know, hopefully something good will come out of this that we can implement across the district. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Schlusner. Kind of on that note, do you have a minimum sample size that you'll need from the school in order to make this a valid or worthwhile study for you? We're looking at 13 teachers. Okay. So and since it's a case study, that will be a valid sample size. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Workman. Um, I would be really interested if you could come back and give us mm -hmm. sort of a general summary of what you found. Once again, not mm -hmm. specific individuals or anything that might identify a particular um, teacher, but this sounds yes. like it, it, it intrigues me. Mm -hmm. so we would be happy to do so. Yes. Yeah. yes, and of course, everything, we would never... Um, say anything about an individual teacher this is is like any research study in that the school itself will be kept anonymous when we publish um and as well as all teachers they will be given identifiers mm -hmm. 
and then the research, of course, any all of our interviews, which will be recorded, will then be destroyed once we have all of our data. Mm -hmm. I, I think this sounds like a really interesting uh, study. Two, two questions. Is it your sort of hypothesis that high teacher efficacy underlies a positive culture? Okay, and then when you go in to observe the teachers, what are you going to be looking for? So when I when I, when both of us go in, we'll go in separately. Mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll do my own in class observation. Dr. Castano Dizer will do her own, and we will be looking for objective information, meaning that we'll be listening for what is being said, and making notes, and we'll be watching. And so it will be objective information. We'll stay away from the subjectivity of mm -hmm. of the process. Um, We'll, we'll be remaining, we'll be focusing and committing ourselves to the facts as to what took place within the classroom. You'll come out with a narrative account of what the teacher said and did. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then is there going to be at some point that you'll determine either that was efficacious or it wasn't? That's when we, when we do our data analysis. That's when we go through and look for when we do our coding. Okay. And just Mr. one Bravo. final question. Um, I, I'm an old union guy, <laughs> firefighter, and, and so I'm, I'm curious uh, to gain full support then of uh, the study effort, was there any effort extended to union leadership or I'm not saying it was required, I was just, I'm just more so curious. Uh, the teachers union, did you maybe engage them or think that maybe along the way it, it might be an idea so that they're fully behind, fully supportive, and fully encouraging a staff to uh, participate? Uh, up front, we, we have not. We, we did get the permission of the, the site principal, sure. um, but we're always, we're always interested in, in interacting in a positive way with, mm -hmm. with all of, our, all of the sure. teachers on board. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so this is a voluntary participation, mm -hmm. and this is a briefing item? Yes. But you want to start in January, correct? Mm -hmm. if, if we could, yes. yes. Move to action. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's now an action item. Be it resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 approves the research study, qualitative re research study, qualitative research study related to climate and culture and teacher self-efficacy at Pinewood Elementary School. Move approval. approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you very time. much. 5.02 approval to purchase math materials. A briefing item, Mr. Munoz. So at this time, I'll have Brenda, uh, Executive Director of uh, CNI, brief us on this agenda item. Yes, it's rather a large expenditure, so we're bringing it before you um, tonight. And this is actually a continuation of that math articulation cycle. You approved materials in the spring and um, they were uh, piloted in some um, seventh and eighth grade and now we're just in the plan was last spring to have that go forward for algebra one and two for all um, seventh and eighth graders and if we purchase the materials now we can get a 15 percent discount maybe Ooh. it's like their black friday sale so <laughs> we just um i worked with john carlson and um, we have a budgeting plan and you know that like i said this has was part of the plan last spring to move forward with this and everybody's anticipating that that happens and um, it's just a good way to save some money so the um, dollar amounts in the resolution is that before or after the 10% 15% that's after okay mm -hmm. darn I was hoping we I could know just they're slice another chunk off but but there are many hundreds of books more too. Than. Mm -hmm. yeah other questions or comments again this is a briefing item well approval second well it's action, briefing action. so we'd have to move to action first okay. 
Second. And it would be good if you move to action because I think they want that commitment by the end of the year. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? My only issue is that when I read this a couple of days ago, I thought it said the hot burger algebra. <laughs> I, 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 and I, I wondered, the same way to me I didn't have my glasses on, and I was thinking, oh, it's all about, you know, fast food. No, but I was disappointed. No, no, no. It's Holt. Holt burger. Did it make you hungry? Okay. No other idiot comments? Ms. No Ms. Ellinger? No. Okay. Um, just uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Wichman and also to Mr. Carlson for, um, you know, being aware of these things and saving us a little bit of money. Um, I think every, we, as we just talked about every little bit helps. And so um, having these things on the horizon, I think it's a, it's great and appreciated. Thank you. All in favor, uh, favor of moving this to action, say aye. 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 Opposed. It's now an action item. Be it resolved the school board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the purchase of new mathematics resources for Rochester Public Schools middle schools, Holt Burger Algebra 1 for $149,884 and Holt Burger Algebra 2, $134,517.60 for a total of $284,401.60. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. 7.01 communications audit. This is an information item, Mr. Munoz. Uh, I get to start us off with giving a, a exactly summary of the uh, communication audit which was done uh, last fall not this past fall but a year ago um, if you remember the organization we had come in and did uh, over 20 focus groups and they provided the district with 11 recommendations and 43 action steps uh, the cabinet decided to look at all of those 11 recommendations and 43 action steps and we kind of broke them in four sections. Uh, those that fit under a strategic, which is uh, you see on the screen which ones those were, parent focused, community focused, and staff focused. Um, even though the audit didn't really talk about students, we <laughs> felt that it was important to include them as part of our uh, plan as well. Um, just want to call to your attention that there was a statement in the audit that's by the auditors who said it would be unreasonable to expect the communication and marketing department to undertake more than two or three of these major communication recommendations <coughs> in a year while maintaining the existing programs. Uh, however, uh, a number of the recommendations do apply to all departments and schools that have been implemented already. I do want to bring to your attention that um, you're going to see as we start presenting some of this, there is some overlap. Uh, as we get through these and then for those of you who are visual like myself uh, on each slide you'll see in the right hand bottom corner of the slide we'll have a little icon that kind of a little gauge that tells you where we think we are in fulfilling that uh, audit. Uh, at this time we have completed or in the process of completing three of the 11 recommendations and 26 action steps. Hey, good evening. The first recommendation. Oh, uh, Julie has a question. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, quick question. So I looked at that. Is the blue part the indicator? Yes. Okay, uh, that's what I kind of figured, yes. but I just wanted to clarify. Yes. Thank you. Um, and because there's a lot of overlap, it might be wait or it might be best to wait at the end. We can do questions, but we can certainly take them along the way too. It's just there is quite a bit of overlap with this. So the first recommendation to develop a strategic communic communication plan aligned with the district strategic plan. And as you know, we've, um, we have a strategic plan, but we are still working through developing the action steps to that strategic plan. Um, and so we have a group called Extended Cabinet, and that group is working on, in subgroups to address those three goals that I have on the screen, access and equity, student achievement, and accountability. 
And once we have that situated and um, developed and fully are fully communicated, we'll develop a strategic communication plan to support that strategic plan. A lot of words of strategic. But we are doing a few things within that recommendation that I think you would find valuable. Um, we're using communication protocol to drive our decisions at cabinet meetings and administration meetings, as well as um, some of our other meetings, such as REA uh, meet and confer and um, leadership meetings. And so what I mean by that is we have protocol questions. We have um, inten intentionally added these <coughs> protocol questions to our agendas, and we will begin using those. It's something we just recently did. Um, but protocol questions that will help frame um, what the issue or what the key topic is, and then how we're going to frame that, who it affects, how we want to wrap our uh, messaging around it, um, what tactics will we use to communicate. So we have those on our agendas for um, the meetings that I just recommended or stated, the REA meet and confer, leadership and administration meetings, as well as cabinet meetings. So that's recommendation one, and as you can see, it fits in the strategic bucket. The second recommendation also fits in the strategic bucket, and that was to continue to develop focused communication plans around critical issues to ensure consistency. And this is a really big area to celebrate. The information that we received in the audit is that we are currently um, doing this, and we are doing it well. Um, so they recommended that we continue with this. And so, you know, we take the information from, you know, a board meeting, and we will distill it down. So if it's an important topic, the task force, for example, I'll pull that out. We'll put that on our website in a specific area so important topics that we know people want to find we pull them out so they're not buried in a series of other notes um, and evidence of that with like I said the task force boundary changes leadership changes we have an entire um, protocol that we go through when we're notifying new leadership changes inviting um, staff to participate in the leadership um, uh, interview process so there's a lot of components that go into it behind the scenes and uh, that is something that obviously NSPRA found to be beneficial to the district and that's two all right I get to uh, take a few of these myself because they overlap into the community area and having worked with the board community engagement committee and through our community ed connections uh, there's a nice um, fit with that. I would just say as I go into three, four, and five that they are similar to each other and there is some overlap. So it may sound like we're repeating, uh, but we're trying to be true to what the original audit had proposed as the recommendations. So just realize that three, four, five, and actually six, seven, eight are all really tied closely together and they have to do with engagement both internal and external. So there's different themes presented in each one. So number three is really about one small piece of the internal and external communication, <coughs> small but important, a key communicators network. And this is uh, something that NSPRA, who is the national group that does these audits, has recommended for years you know, to do in whatever format works in your district. And so this is a piece that I would say we do through a number of areas, through uh, boards and leadership teams out in the community that many of us sit on, uh, uh, advisory groups that we host within the district, um, all staff messages that go out. There's a lot of different communication. Um, but you'll see just a little bit of blue on there, and that's because we have not formed that formal key communicators network yet. But that's coming. So um, I would say their advice in the audit was about that these groups are mostly operational um, in terms of the uh, work of that group is to share out accurate information about what's going on in the district. It's kind of about establishing your own grapevine, so to speak, and that's how they refer to it in the audit. That is, uh, rather than allowing rumors to grow, things like that, you can put out uh, accurate information. And by inviting in the people who have influence in their spheres out in the community and uh, are willing to say, yes, I will object when I hear something that I know is not accurate, that we can build a little bit more of that. It's two-way, though, as well, that they agree to let us know. 
if there's a rumor floating out there, if there's some grumbling going on, or if there's some ideas out there that are positive in nature. So it's a two-way street that um, those who agree to be a part of it start with a meeting and then agree to do most of that via phone calls and emails, things like that. These are adults and students, um, the audit suggests, and these are people with credibility in their influence circles, so opinion leaders, people uh, that others trust. Uh, it gives us a quick informal pulse on what's going on in the community, but it also allows us, again, that rumor control, being able to get accurate information out, and they say critics should be welcome in this group, and they often become supporters once they're in that network. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would just like to say one more thing about that. We, as they mentioned, we do have a lot of uh, opportunities that we do that, but don't have a formal, consistent group. For example, I, every month we have uh, the first Monday of the month, uh, I have attend the government forums meeting, and that's the leaders from the city, uh, the mayor, city council, the county uh, commissioners, uh, chambers there, our legislators are there, um, our higher ed leaders are there, so it's, it's pretty much the leaders in the community. And that's, it's a great opportunity for us to talk about what's going on in our district, but so, so we don't want you to think that we don't have some of that going on, but we don't have a formal group that meets <coughs> regularly that helps us with, uh, with that recommendation. Thanks, Mike. Uh, recommendation number four, closely connected. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were my clicker. <laughs> I, I'm advanced it here for myself. <laughs> this one has to do with staff members and specifically in the decision-making process. So it talks about uh, strengthening the engagement of staff members in decision-making. You'll hear another one a little bit later on general staff member communication. Uh, but in reading the audit, they had some key considerations to this, one of which was don't ask for input if the decision's already made. And that seems so simple. But it's a good rule, right? But the other thing they said is clarify where the authority for that final decision really is. Because if people come in and they think that you're going to take their vote and run with it, as opposed to taking their input and putting it all together with the other input and then ending up at a decision, that's a different matter. So I thought that was good advice from them about clarifying where that decision point is. They gave us eight action steps under this one, some at the district level and some at the building level. So this will take some work uh, in both areas with the key of clear expectations for those who are giving input and then really providing a variety of opportunities um, when it comes to methods of input. So you can see the list there of what we're already using in terms of input, and you're aware of these from conversations here at the board and your own experience. Uh, there are chances for uh, in-person input, electronic input, uh, written input. So trying to use that variety already, but that's part of what's under recommendation for. And you'll see that we consider us partway there, but not all the way there on that one. And recommendation five specifically talks to parents and community members. So the last one was staff and decision making. This one is about engagement of staff or uh, engagement of parents and community members. Um, so you'll see there some samples of district level and school level engagement that goes on. The advice in the audit was about providing structure and topics. And the comment was open-ended venting is not particularly useful. I like that line. <laughs> um, we've all been there when there are not those structured opportunities. And so that, I thought, was very good advice. They advised web tools, which we are doing, um, and then follow through communication after the opportunity so that people know what input we received. And then again, a variety of voices and perspectives. And I think that's a constant area of work for us is to really make sure that we're getting as many voices and perspectives as possible. We're never done with that work. I think I'm back to Mike. Yes. All right, recommendation six. Uh, this is strategies to improve communication with all staff. And as you can see uh, by the gauge in the lower right corner, this is another area that we 
feel that we, uh, at least at the district level, um, are uh, getting better at. Um, I think also in the in the audit, uh, at least for me, it was sometimes a little bit challenging because at times you didn't know if they were referencing at the district level or at the building level. So uh, I, I would say, at least what I'm hearing, this is that probably uh, we could uh, work with administration to uh, do a little bit better job at, at the site level as far as communication. Um, this included eight action steps uh, related to this recommendation. We currently have practices that address six of the eight. And as you see on the, on the slide there, there's some of the examples. Um, sending out school board and cabinet notes to all staff. Uh, we use social media, district website, uh, providing information in the written format for those who do not receive emails uh, and producing videos. And this is something that uh, we even Last year, we're doing monthly videos, but uh, during the facility task force work, uh, actually, those videos have been more frequently than monthly. Uh, you know, I think they did recommend that keep them really short videos. So it's really a ch for me, it's a challenge to get a lot of information in in a short period of time. Uh, but I think I think we even had uh, a parent or two come to the board and, and said they appreciated having those videos. Uh, and then I think another thing that's been really good is that we um, are live streaming board meetings. Uh, a lot of the facility tasks for the citizen voice, we live stream those. So if they couldn't physically come here, they could participate at home and, and provide input electronically. Um, we will uh, continue to look how we can uh, communicate better. Uh, and one of the things that um, an area where we believe we have to get better at is explaining, you know, for, for example, the facilities uh, update videos that did, probably making them a little bit longer, explaining why, um, for example, why we, the facility task force is recommending the middle, new middle school Southwest. Well, the rationale is that, that the growth, eventually we're gonna need another high school. Well, obviously that would be in the Southwest, so why not have the new middle school feed it? So uh, that's an area that we have to get better at is explain the, the, the rationale behind uh, some of the decisions that were, uh, have been made. Thanks for touching on that, because that's gonna bring that up. What's that? Thanks for touching on yeah. it, because that's gonna bring that up. Yeah. Uh, and then a recommendation seven, clicker. Sorry. Um, this is, uh, Develop and implement additional strategies to improve communication from the district and schools with parents. And we, if you look at the icon there, we it's kind of half covered. We think that we were uh, have made some good strides in that area, but we still have uh, a ways to go to improve our communication with parents. And what we do now is we share important topics with our building principals, and they can choose if they want to share district-wide topics with their families through their newsletters. Uh, we've increased, as I said earlier, we increased our video messages that we have sent out, uh, especially with the task force updates. Uh, we're creating more videos about things going on in the various schools. Uh, and then each fall, the communication team meets with uh, the office managers and shares practices and expectations for Peach Jar and websites and Skyward. You know, one of the um, things that came up in the audit, audit and something that's going to, it, it's going to be a challenge for us. Uh, I believe we need to do it, but it's going to probably run into a little resistance when we do take this one on and we will get those that are going to be impacted by that decision at the table to help us make that decision. But what parents were said in the audit was they like the different things that teachers are using to communicate with them about their children. But if I have a student at all three levels, I have three different things. So uh, they recommended that we establish maybe one or two consistent ways of communicating with parents. And uh, so, like I said, we're going to have to uh, get a group of teachers together and have a conversation about that. But I'm sure there may be some that will be unhappy that they will no longer be able to use whatever they're currently using. So that's an area that we know we have to, to improve in. All right. So recommendation eight was to develop and implement strategies to enhance communication with residents without children. So on the screen, you can see some of the things that we are currently doing. Um, we partner with community education uh, with the newsletters that they send out with key or critical topics. Um, 
and that's a very kind thing that they allow us to do. We also have changed our family engagement process. So while this talks about residents without children, um, our family engagement process, we try, we're try we attempting to go into communities more. So perhaps it may not be um, somebody who has a student in our district, but maybe it's a grandparent or, or someone along those lines. And then we offer, um, we're trying to offer more meals at our community engagement or family engagement events. We have something coming up in in uh, January with the Rochester Police Department and we're working through what that looks like but we want to involve not just parents but other community members um, and so when we're thinking about marketing that bringing food to the table is always something that helps get people there and then things like National Night Out where we're in a neighborhood and we'd like to see the neighborhood community come uh, meet us and likewise us meet them um, another thing I put in here was like the Mayo Clinic Emer uh, the Emirati staff Emirate Emer I always say that wrong um, this is something I put in here because uh, principals, two principals, Chris Davidson and Jared Grayler, worked with this group to bring them together to talk about technology in the district. So this is an influential group of retired uh, staff from the Mayo Clinic and sharing technology with them and letting them play and understand what we're doing was eye-opening to them because they're not coming into our buildings and and because of that we built a relationship in which some of these individuals want to come see what we're doing in action. Um, and we, this, the superintendent works with our retired educators and has um, conversations with them, the Kiwanis and Rotary Group. So we're networking with individuals out in the community and we feel you know we can certainly do better with that, but we definitely have some things in place. Um, and the last bullet is something I just wanna share with our schools. Uh, Churchill and Hoover, they have something called Husky Time every six days in their cycle. And during that time, the students made placemats for a local um, nursing community and retirement community. And so the kids then delivered the placemats. And likewise, we have Longfellow has a fourth and fifth grade choir that goes and sings at the Charter House and several other retirement communities. And the, light, the faces just light up when those kids come in. And so that's just two examples of how our kids and our schools are working um, with folks that do not have children in our district. And when we have plays, I know uh, Mayo High School and so I believe, it, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken, it's Century High School, will offer a senior day on a Wednesday prior to the play opening. Things like that are something that um, I think is rec we should recognize. And then with recommendation number nine, uh, there weren't action steps necessarily, but it was just to develop a focused marketing strategy to identify and communicate the district's brand identity and to clearly tell the story. So what do we stand for? Um, a tagline. And so, you know, we're kind of in the process of doing that. Uh, we do follow th some of the recommendations such as utilizing a school planner so we know what we have going forward for a full year in terms of key events that we need to hone in on and maybe produce a video to support or um, have a press release ready for. And then we also uh, utilize our social media and we schedule posts specific to um, the activity or the, the holiday or whatever it may be. So we do things like that that are strategic, um, but in terms of the tagline, that's something that we don't have flushed out, but we are in the process of working through um, some creative advertising with um, a local news station, and it's really talking about using the language from our grad profile, and we're talking about a series of um, commercials that we can use and when we post on social media I try to pull the language from our grad profile so we're slowly but surely infusing that language those characteristics into the messaging that we share publicly um, and we do utilize social media it's low cost to try to reach people um, and with the, uh, the post bulletin we've utilized them from a marketing platform too for staff recruitment and retention so while we don't have a tagline necessarily, we're working through that, and I think as we get through our strategic plan, we might have a better idea of a, of a catchy slogan. Right now, we've just been using Inspire, Challenge, and Power. And then 10 is something I'm excited to share. We have been building 29 websites from the ground up. We don't have any content migration whatsoever. Um, and so this is gonna be a great 
uh, step for the district in the right direction. The audit spoke a lot about the frustration with the district website and the school websites. Um, and so the goal is right there, you know, prove functionality and have uh, language that's parent friendly. Highlight the district and school, and school success stories and it is going to be very digitally rich um, and so photographs and videos will be really abundant on our website. And then, um, you know, standardized content. We want to give our sites their own feeling, but we want some, you know, their own culture so that it reflects what happens in their buildings, but we want consistency. And so we're working through all of those pieces. And of course, the accessibility component um, is a very important reason why we took on this project when we did. And um, as you, you know, as I was reading the audit, they wanted us to look at award-winning websites. Well, we began this process about a year ago with an audit of more than 60 school district websites. And now as we build this with Final Sight, their, their ultimate goal, our project manager and design rep, is to make our site a model site. So anyone that's looking to pursue Final Sight for their potential school, or for their school district's potential website, we'd be a model for them. Um, so we're working on that, and the website is extremely mobile responsive, which the current website that we have is not. So it's very frustrating for a user. Um, and so that is the website, and here's the last one. Yeah, just one comment. Just uh, we did use our thought exchange tool to uh, get feedback on what parents want uh, on a website. So that was something that we uh, and staff, parents and staff, and staff. As well, to get input. So, mm -hmm. all right, recommendation eleven. Uh, they they recommend that we examine the district's current investment in communication functions and consider adding a staff position to assist with implementing the strategic communication plan. Um, not, there's not much blue on there because we haven't done that and I'm not for sure if we're going to be able to afford to do that, but it will be something as we uh, start January and start looking at the next year's budget. It'll be something that'll be on our wish list, but not for sure if it'll make it through all of the, the process, but it's something that they did recommend and uh, if we have the funding, that's something that we will, we will try to do. And then I have the opportunity to kind of bring this to close. I'm, I'm the closer for tonight. And a uh, number of recommendation actions have to apply to all departments of schools have been implemented already. Uh, just a reminder that they, they suggested not to take on more than two or three, but we did take more than that. Uh, and then we, we believe that the audit is, is going to something that's going to help us moving forward with communication. and. Uh, my p goal is that once we get a district uh, communication plan in, then the next step is to work with sites and have them establish a communication plan, internal and external, that matches the district but more site specific. So that's kind of what uh, we look forward to doing in the future. So we will answer any questions. Ms. Berkman. Yeah, I'd like to start with recommendation 11 that we you just discussed. And um, I was wondering if. Um, it's been considered, um, as was recommended in the report, to consider ad adding a budget line for contract services for specific um, projects or perhaps an, um, an intern. I don't know if we could work with Winona State, perhaps, if they have a communications intern who's looking for an internship, which would probably maybe be less expensive for us than ha hiring a person with a whole lot of experience. So I think you know, that could be beneficial to us and to the student as well. Thank you. Other comments, questions, Mr. Barlow? Uh, yes. Um, and congratulations. I mean, uh, of the 11 recommendations, seven of them, you're already at 50% uh, or more. So even though the recommendation is that shouldn't take on more than one or two, obviously it's just a recommendation. And you guys have demonstrated that you're quite capable of actually taken on more than one or two and uh, so it seems like uh, recommendation one is a key recommendation and uh, a lot seems to evolve around the plan itself um, so are you in a position at this point to even speak about that or give any idea is Hiring a or acquiring an intern or finding a position key to 
the plan being completed, or I'd like to perhaps understand that just a tad bit yeah, more. Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't say it's necessary. It obviously would make it uh, easier, but we are, have already started pieces of that, but really uh, until we get the uh, strategic plan completed and then we can use that to help us finish the, the communica district communication plan. So there, there are pieces put together already and, and I think because of that, that allowed us to do some of the work that we just shared with you tonight. Uh, but, um, and then I think, um, as it was mentioned earlier, we, the extended cabinet, which is the cabinet and other district uh, administrators and people uh, in this building that have been working on the three goals, but uh, I think I shared with the board that we have the opportunity, uh, we were invited to participate in the Innovation Transformational Leadership Network and working with Bill Daggett. And um, I know when we uh, met with him that one Sunday, he was really uh, impressed with our graduate profile because it really felt, it really matched what he uh, is, believes schools need to do. Uh, so, we uh, are in the process of scheduling his visit in January. Uh, we want him to visit with the, the group that's been working on, on our action steps and measurements to give us a little direction and guidance in that. But uh, we're hopefully shortly after uh, that, we'll have a little more direction and where we should move forward. And, uh, but really, we'll continue to work on that, uh, Don, but I, we won't be able to finalize it until we have the action steps and measurements for the strategic plan. I have one quick question. How are the, the indicators about how much each uh, res recommendation is completed or how successful it is, who's measuring that or how do you measure we, that? We, as a cabinet, we just talk about everything that we're doing in that area and say, where, where do you think we are? And we just, I mean, there's no um, strategic. <laughs> Depends on your we, didn't do, we didn't do any coding or whatever like we heard earlier to, to figure that out, but we just kind of got together and said, where do you think we are uh, based on all the different ideas and things that we shared that we, we're currently doing? Okay, I, you know, clearly this is a really really important and really dynamic plan and, and area, and I'm guessing that it's part of your plan that once a quarter or twice a year, whatever, come back to the board with sort of an update for more discussion things change quickly so uh, I, I think it's important that we understand we're not done with this it's going to yeah. be an ongoing exactly. important initiative mr. Schlusner a couple of things uh, not just the website but all communications is there discussion about I ask this all the time uh, translation we currently so that's a great question we currently work with our bilingual staff in terms of translation so any major documents um, we do translate in top five languages the challenge is, um, and I, the bilingual staff has shared this with me, it's more efficient for our staff to actually have a conversation rather than the translation. However, we still do that with student behavior handbook, the student handbook, other pieces. Um, a perfect example of this is with our survey that we'll be working on for uh, the referendum. I met with the bilingual staff and I said, I'm curious, this is how many students we have that speak Spanish, this is the number of students that speak Somali. Does it make sense to translate? And we talked about putting phone numbers on the survey so that anyone who wants to participate in the survey can call and then our bilingual staff can do the survey with them over the phone, it's a few minutes long. But the more critical piece is the family engagement. Having events where we can go out to the community. And so um, that's one piece or one example. Another example is, when we send out Skylerts to families and our Skylert message emails that go out are usually about big things from the district, whether it's inclement weather or it is, um, you name it, I can't think of a, a big thing right now, um, or if it's a reminder about no school for whatever. On the bottom of that Skylert, and you've probably seen this, there are different languages that say, please call. And before that goes out to families, I make sure that information is sent to our bilingual team. So if I'm sending something on behalf of a school, which I do on a frequent basis, um, I'll make sure that the bilingual team has that. So if they were to get calls, they knew they know how to answer that. Um, but you know, we have some great resources in them. But could we have more? Pro yes, absolutely. But I remember our auditor saying, "I wish I had what your district has with the bilinguals." So yeah, just a specific example is they. Um, 
when we were doing the immunization, trying to get our kids signed up uh, before school started, that they had a list of families that they made personal phone calls because um, we weren't for sure that they were getting the messages that we were sending out through SkyAlert. So they made personal phone calls with them and explained what the district was asking of them. Uh, so we, we tried to do that on really critical things uh, like that, but um, the other is just through, I mean, we are, uh, other districts, superintendents I talk to, they don't have what we have just down the hallway here that's very, a very useful uh, resource, not only to us, but to our families. Right. And, and then the other thing is, is as Mike, you had already touched on, especially with the, the facilities task forces, you know, from the communication, I, I do think a lot of the right things are going on, but sometimes the clarity of message uh, isn't there as much. You know, having been a, the, com the board member through the task force committees, yeah, everything in the updates is clear to me because I've been through this yeah. stuff. So just looking at, say, you know, in this case, you know, the Kevin's or the consultant's presentation on the board, uh, I don't know if it's overstepping our boundaries as a district or not, but sometimes his presentations are just clear to the community unless they've been through everything uh, as we have all heard on the board from many dozens of parents when just bo generic boundary changes even though we we know it was very uh, draft very conceptual uh, clarity on something like that is critically important especially as we want to have a successful binding referendum in 2019. Ms. Workman. I, I feel sort of like we're you know, we're in the chicken or the egg state right now with recommendation one. Um, on page 44 of the booklet that we got, they suggested that um, a strategic, strategic communication plan and a marketing plan that aligns with the district's strategic goals and objectives is a critical priority for us to undertake in the next 12 months because these plans will be the cornerstones of other communications components. So I'm curious to find out, I mean, in those three things were the ac access and equity, student achievement and accountability. So how do, you, how do you incorporate that moving forward or where do you see yourselves in the process of those strategic goals at this point without a, dis a lengthy dissertation? <laughs> well, I will first respond with, um, when we look at the, distri the district strategic plan, NSPRA, um, puts together very robust plans for districts, um, hundreds of pages. I have a sample sitting on my desk. Um, and so we haven't reached out to NSPRA or allocated resources for them to do that for us. We have what I would consider a microscopic version of that where we know um, the things that are coming down the pike for us for the next year or more. And that is, if we're looking at it, it is developing our strategic plan and the goals that go with that and how do we communicate that to families. It's the task force and how do we communicate that to families. It is um, in the technology world we're going through a refresh so how do we communicate that to our technology staff. So I look at it in the things that are happening in my department but I also work with our cabinet for roadmaps as well. What are the articulation cycles we're going through in curriculum and instruction and how do we get people involved in that. So those are the those are the key pieces we have are those roadmaps and it's putting them together in a plan that we know we have that we talk about but um, it's not something that I have printed here so it's a microscopic version of what NSPRA and and I don't know if I'm answering that the best that I could but we do have strategies in place for those key initiatives that the district is taking on I, I wasn't real clear I guess in my question so um, when recommendation one was addressed earlier this evening, the point was made that the strategic communication plan will support the strategic goals of the district, but the strategic goals of the district are still in a work in progress. So if you've got this work in progress, I don't know how far along that work in progress oh. is, so that this communication strategic plan can be based on that, because it seems like you have to have the strategic plan goals kind of a little bit more fleshed out perhaps before you can get in more depth with the communication strategic plan, which they are recommending as the, the, this will be the cornerstone of the other 
communication components. So I guess I'm just curious as to where we are on those three goals. On those three things. And that, oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, as I, I think I even at our last closed session shared with you the work of the three groups. That's pretty much where we're at. Um, we made a decision that we need to slow down a little bit because we feel being part of this innovation uh, transformational leadership network, mm -hmm. that's gonna give us uh, more resources and, and best practices that we currently aren't aware of that may be helpful for us as we create uh, action steps uh, for each of those three goals. Uh, but that doesn't mean those three goals are just sitting there. We're not doing anything about them. We're, we are doing some, you know, the, the, the first one is in many of our conversations when we make decisions is how does that address access and equity across our district? So we're doing some of the goals, but they're not finalized. And then once they're finalized, as I said, we, we already have pieces of the, of the comprehensive communication plan, but we can't finalize it until we have the strategic plan finalized. I guess that's kind of where I was going yeah. with it because it seems there seems to be a little yeah. tension in there as to which do you do first and how much of it. So thank yeah. you. Other questions? Somebody else have a question because I have a mention <laughs> <laughs> well, Just wait. I mean, you well, should think about this. Uh, I have a quick one. Uh, <clears throat> is there any way to gauge the effectiveness of the uh, roles that the um, bilinguals play and the extent or degree to which they are reaching their uh, target audience, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly it sounds like you can speak to successes based on the amount when contact does occur. Are we aware of the percentage of uh, contacts which are not occurring even though efforts may be uh, being expended. Yeah, the only thing I can think of right away is the example I gave uh, when we gave them a list of, of families to call about the immunization and they were able to give us a report back on how many families they made contact with and uh, which ones were um, going to come down and, and fill out the waiver or which ones were going to um, make an appointment for that. But we, we do not collect. We don't ask them to to collect data like that. Um, what we have is just um, uh, data that they tell us that the contacts are making and, and interacting with uh, individuals out in the community uh, know these individuals in that office very well. And um, but I guess we've never asked them to kind of document you know how many contacts they made and, and the results. Of well, that. it's not really a number I'm looking for, but uh, in that we are speaking of uh, communication effectiveness. Um, uh, Director Marvin and I have, I'm sure along with other board members, have engaged some of uh, our uh, ethnic communities and oftentimes we'll hear, well, we weren't aware of this or no one told us about that. And, and that's why I inquire regarding that. Uh, it, it sounds like if it's issue driven, uh, inoculations. That's a very important thing to uh, put forth that concerted effort. Um, uh, it's a kind of a readdressing the, the point that Director Schlusner had raised. Uh, uh, to what degree or extent are we uh, putting in language, uh, for instance, the grad profile? Will that be, you know, uh, student handbook, you've answered yes. Uh, and I'm not really asking for an accounting at this right. point, but just really just a, I think, a open communication that um, uh, we have heard uh, contemporaneously that uh, there are families uh, that are being missed, if you will, not uh, attempting to uh, uh, lay blame, but just create awareness. May I add one? comment. One thing I forgot to mention when Director Schlusner asked, with our new website, and I worked with the bilingual coordinator on this, um, other districts do it, there you can have a Google Translate in multiple languages. It's not correct in terms of what they translate, but it is better than nothing in terms of you can 
essentially find your way to where you need to be when you can translate it. So we talked about the pros and cons. Is it, does it make sense to do this in our top you know, five languages? And the answer I, we think at this point is yes. Um, and so he was trying to read through one of the languages that we translated on another, on another site. And he's like, well, it's not correct, but I can piece together what this is enough. And so that's definitely something that we plan to explore, provided um, technology, you know, the Google Translate is a, is a tricky thing in terms of technology, but um, it's something that we are planning to implement on our new website. Thank you. You ready, Ms. Seelinger? I guess I'm done with my mid sure. now. Okay, for okay. waiting. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, a couple things that I, I like to pull out that I uh, appreciated hearing, um, something that was in my other notes and kind of what you said is sort of like those critical questions, and I think that's actually in the big report, or I don't know, it's in my notes from something, who knows, um, about you know who needs to know, what do they need to know, how are we gonna tell them? Yeah. Why, you know, what do they need, when do they need it, and what do we want them to do with this information I think is really important, and I think we've kind of talked about those themes. So I appreciate kind of hearing that um, anecdotally as you're looking at different things. Um, so I, I had a couple things in my notes, but um, one thing is um, how do you see us moving forward? Now we've had this, um, you know, we've had the audit, it's been a year, we know that we're still working on strategies. You know, are you thinking in another year, in another two year, how, how, how are we gonna know that we're doing well, that our, our stakeholders are saying, yes, we're feeling more informed, um, you know, does the organ, whatever they're called, have, you know, do they come back and kind of do a follow up, or are we gonna do some, you know, other thought exchanges or things, just to make sure like, yep, this is, we're, we're on the right track. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I don't know if we'll pay them to come back and do this again, but uh, I think we can use thought exchange and, and we just recently uh, did one to ask two simple questions. What are we doing well and what can we do get better at? And, you know, we'll, I think we'll get some feedback there. I, I would just, my opinion, I would, from 2011 when I came to where we're now, I think we are doing a better job of communicating at the district level. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I can say that across the system at the, at the site level. Um, as far as when do I think we're gonna get, I don't think we'll ever get there, but I think we'll continue to get better. I, I will have to say, um, this probably hasn't gotten as much attention as we would like it to because you know since June, we've been uh, rather busy with the facility task force work and getting ready for a referendum. So um, I, I guess I just can't give you a timeline when I think we'll have that. Uh, comprehensive communication plan completed and but I think as we do thought exchanges just asking general questions how, you know, how are we doing and what what areas can we get better I think will give us some good feedback as well thank you mr. Smith do you have a okay anything else yeah um, <clears throat> so with the Google trans translator whether it's good or not can you have like a note in the language that is grammatically correct that says we know the translator might not be perfect, but you know you can, uh, however you want to say it. But kind of, I can you, talk. I can talk with. Um, you know, because it's you know because I think. Then you know whoever is looking at it in this other language is going to know that, you know that the district knows it's not a hundred percent perfect. So you've kind of looked at it, and it's not that you've just. Well, Google Translator, it's out there, it's got to be right. And so I just, I think that would also, you know, give a little bit more, um, I don't know, validity to the, you know, to the website. Um, and then to follow on uh, Don's question, when the, um, when we talk to the, um, when the bilinguals talk to the parents who don't, no, do we, again, talking about how, um, how much they're being used or not, how often do the parents say, okay, yeah, I know, I'm just not gonna, you know, I just haven't done it yet, or, you know, but I, I know. Mm -hmm. So, just to, you know, are there some parents who, yeah, they might not speak English, but, you know, they know everything that's going on, or you know what percentage what percentage of parents do that. That just might be something that 
you know, might also want to check to see, you know, if 95% of the people who don't, you know, who English isn't their native language, but they still all know, um, that just might be something that, that would be good to know as a district. I think um, when we met with the bilinguals, I think it was Deborah and Jean, uh, my impression is that the parents want them even more than just for school things. Oh. So they get a relationship with them and they depend on them and they begin to ask advice beyond school and sort of, you know, you're my one helper, please, you know. So I would be surprised if we found that there were too many parents that were using their services but didn't need their services, if that's okay. kind of yeah. what you're no, getting yep, at. No, yep, that's what, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. That's but. just a gut feeling, not scientific, but just listening to the anecdotal data. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Younger. Um, I would like to share a story that we heard today at Family Engagement about the community meal they did at Homestead Terrace last week from uh, Melissa Brandt and uh, Katie Miller. And um, sounded like they had over 50 people there. Um, there was a lot of game playing and a lot of um, networking com com camaraderie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm not quite sure if this was with a, with a bilingual or not. Katie Miller shared that um, a mom said that, you know, I work from 7 in the morning till 7 at night, and, you know, the last thing I can think about when I come home is worrying about, you know, is my kid at school or whatever. You know, we know these challenges. And, and the mom said, you know, I just feel like nobody is listening to me and Katie Miller could say I'm here I'm listening to you and I just you know for me as you know a board member sitting up here to hear a staff member to you know give that time to that family and to that one-on-one -on -one person you know I mean that's a golden opportunity and um, and I know that you referenced the family type meals in here and things like that and so um, we have those those nuggets going on and those relationships being made and I think that's just going to make us stronger all together so um, kudos for those folks who really put their time in there. Um, my, my final question is, I know Heather, you've worked so much on the website over the last year and we've had many conversations and um, you know, you've got the platter, not the plate. Um, and this is kind of an odd question, but where, uh, when you look at all these things, um, where is your excitement and enthusiasm for this work? Like, what are you really excited to dig into next? Or is it like everything? Or is, are there just certain things? <laughs> In our world, it's hard to have just to focus on one thing, right? Um, yeah, the website is something that I'm, I'm really excited about because it has been a year in progress. And I, we listened to what our staff and what our parents were saying, and I'm really thrilled to give them what we think they wanted. Um, and then we get to ask, is this what you wanted? And if not, then we're going to make adjustments. Um, and we can do that through thought exchange. But in general, I like the idea of I'm very process driven. So for me and, and my team, it's really knowing um, here's where we're at, here's where we want to get to. And that's kind of that chicken and egg piece where we're working through our strategic plan and we are starting to incorporate the language from the strategic plan. Do we have all the goals yet? Nope. But we're working and in, in weaving that in. So. For me, it's looking at where, we're, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Does that answer yes, your question? Absolutely. Sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you, know, you need to tweet your a little bit. You know, and the other thing I will say, too, is just um, I think we're doing a much better job and making a very concerted effort, um, not just district-wide, but with our school um, leadership in that two-way communication. And I, I feel like that's been lacking. Um, you know, we'll give you information, but how do we hear back from you? Um, some sites are better at it than others, and, and we certainly all can get better. So improving that is a really important piece, I think. Um, here's what we're doing. Tell us and give us feedback. And when you spoke, Don, about, um, well, I didn't know that. So I want to hear those pieces so we know what we can improve upon and what we can offer to folks. Mr. Solicitor. You sparked a final question. <laughs> so one of the updates is cabinet members now go out to various schools. It'd be great to hear a summary on how that's going or what the school's concerns are from the cabinet members point of view I, I don't we're really not going out to, to it's not like a listening session it's just they're visiting classrooms talking to staff they're uh, attending staff meetings um, you know it, it's it's 
informal. It's a, it's a little challenging for us because when we go into schools, it's it's. Oh no! Somebody from district <laughs> office from downtown is here in our in my classroom. So we really don't want to make it look and feel like we're evaluating or or whatever. So it's really just uh, having. The individuals that are assigned to certain schools you're kind of like their liaison for for those schools in the district and um i, I know cabinet members have attended ca uh, staff meetings and and so they're getting some information from that but really it's just getting in the classrooms and and just getting in the schools and and being familiar with what's going on in each of those schools so when we get together as a group uh all right how can we support the schools that we're visiting and um I think it's even a little more different when I go in because, um, well, for one, the kids think you're the president, which is, feels kind of good. <laughs> no, he's not the president. So, but, you know, I don't, when I go into classrooms, I try not, for one, I don't want to interrupt them and say, well, now you have to stop teaching because I'm in here. Uh, but typically the, the, we do have a conversation. They want to know what a superintendent does and, and the, the little one is best to explain well he's kind of the boss of all the schools in rochester and and then um so it's really trying to just get to know the schools better so as we try to figure out how to support them we've been in the in the classroom we've been in the buildings to know what's going on and um i mean we you know i think something we talked about today is is i think um uh, brenda my the last meeting shared with you the instructional rounds that uh, three of the cabinet members are doing and we talked to, today at cabinet about coming to the board and at least sharing some of the, the things themes that we're seeing and uh, we've been trying to and uh, you also get the uh, cabinet minutes mm -hmm. like all staff do and we do make a couple comments in there about what you know they visited such and such school this is what they saw so but we'd be happy to do that but I, I don't know how much we we could give you from our informal visits because it's really uh different than in you know i think a year or so ago we went into the actually listening sessions for each school and and just took uh any concerns or suggestions or ideas they have but it's it's we can try to do that well and, and the, the clarification i think is good because i've mentioned this to Dr. Marvin a couple of times where like at last year's National School Board meeting I sat through the North San Antonio School Board's discussion where various school board members are assigned to different schools and it just helped build that that relationship between the family organizations and the schools and the, the school district maybe it's a variation of the professional network in a certain sense or I guess this is perhaps then now geared more towards my fellow school board directors of again I, f I feel we should take on schools and PTAs and, and uh, build those relationships. <laughs> uh, I, I would encourage, I mean, that's why we try to, in the uh, cabinet information we send out, we do put a calendar of events and uh, I would encourage you to attend some of those events. I know the schools would love to have you come to the different things that are going on uh, in the schools. I think that's a great way for you to to uh, get to know the buildings and see some of the awesome things that are happening every day. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to do that. Totally agree, and that's where I feel if we divvied up the schools, we'd at least know, okay, I'm lo always looking out for a school A, B, C, and D, and their events, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually a discussion that w I, we're planning on having in the board um, in January, so. Great, Thank great. you. Ms. Workman. I, I think. I'm really interested in recommendation four, which is to develop and implement strategies to strengthen the engagement of staff members in the district's decision-making process. I, I think this is really good, and you touched on a number of things in terms of, you know, do you ask for input if the decision's all, already been made? And I can tell you from my years of teaching experience that that's really annoying if that happens, mm -hmm. and then staff tend to disengage as a result. Um, but I was thinking about this in terms of, of what we were presented earlier from the Pinewood research study um, in terms of school climate and how some of these things, not all of them because there are pages of them, um, could be um, implemented and then get feedback from staff about do they think it's important, is it working, and maybe that's something that could be 
somebody could maybe have a discussion with the REA leadership if they're interested in doing some of this um, kind of thing together because I think a lot of times it, it is really critical that people don't understand who's making the decisions and they don't understand maybe what their role might be in making those decisions especially if we are encouraging sites to be you know digging down a little bit deeper in terms of this is what we need for our site here so that's just kind of an aside is maybe something that we can have a, a conversation about at another time okay thank you and if there are no more comments questions we are going to take a five minute re uh, recess and we are recessed at 7 10 p.m. O2 five-year general fund financial forecast this is an information item mr. Munoz yes mr. John Carlson executive director of finance will brief us on this information item Munoz, chair Marvin I've got seven items to do in about one hour and 15 minutes approximately to get it done, so. Ooh, gosh. <laughs> no. well, I'm just kidding. Okay. So that's the outside limit, right? Yes, okay. there you go. So uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is a five-year general fund forecast. So I wanted to do this uh, for you tonight before you approve the levy. Next, just so you have a better picture of where we're going in the general fund for the next uh, few years. So just a refresher, we've done this uh, multiple times with you before, but we do this a couple times a year, once around May, June. Uh, that's generally to deal with um, changes in the state budget and any other uh, contract settlements that we've had. And then we do it in November, December timeframe to kind of be in context with the levy as well as um, closing out the books from the previous school year. So here are our revenue assumptions, uh, very similar to what we've had in the past. We are still hopeful that the state legislature will increase per pupil funding at a rate of 2% each year. Uh, we have had that for four years in a row now, and so uh, given the good news of the state uh, projected budget surplus, we're hopeful that 2% might even be higher, um, or we might get more than that. So. Uh, we're crossing our fingers, but for this projection, we're assuming 2%. Uh, the voter-approved referendum is still in place at $895.70 per pupil unit. It will continue to go up with inflation uh, through school year 25-26. We have the local optional revenue uh, that the board has taken. That's at 424. That one does not grow by inflation, as well as the school board approved referendum of 166.65. That one's locked in at that amount, and we can't go higher. Um, I will need to bring a resolution to you soon to renew that. Um, it was good for five years when you passed the resolution. That's the most you can do at one time. And so if we want to continue that, we'll need to pass that sometime in the next calendar year. And then restricted funding, of course, we always assume that if we're going to get a grant or a donation that we'll have expenditures that will match, and we won't spend more than that. On the expenditure side, it's a little bit more complicated in this forecast because we have a couple things, uh, big things here in play. Uh, first on salaries and benefits, the way we uh, settled with the teachers on their last contract, we gave a bigger percentage of increase to the salary schedule in the second year, which kind of has a tails effect like we talked about back in May. And um, that potentially will limit what we have available to offer on the 2019 uh, to 21 contract, depending on, of course, state funding. Um, so we're assuming 2% and 2% on teachers for both of those years, and then we're assuming 2.5% for teachers um, and everyone else beyond uh, the 21 school year. We have factored in 10 new teaching positions for the 1920 school year. We haven't slotted them in any certain category, just assuming that we'll have some growth and we'll need some additional positions. For contracted services, supplies, capital, utilities, we're planning for 3% increases so that we recognize that there will be some sort of inflation. We're hoping that um, it, prices won't go up that much and we'll be able to take a little bit off that as we get closer to each year. And we're also hoping on your utility budget that we um, stay flat or maybe even start declining soon on a couple of those big line items. Transportation's a big um, variable right now. We're not ready to uh, bring forward to you the next contract. We have opened the bids, but we are unfortunately estimating a double-digit percentage increase uh, to our transportation services. So um, I prefer not to talk too much more in detail on that because we need, need to have some negotiations um, <clears throat> Excuse me, with the vendors that responded to those bids recently, and that's coming up on Thursday this week. 
Um, from there, we're planning for about 3% after the initial shock of the 10% plus adjustment. So this is a, a quick summary in millions of dollars where we are at right now. I'll caution you that 1819, we know very well uh, the people that we have on payroll right now, we know the students that we have, so we're very confident in the revenues and expenditures for 1819. 1920, we're slightly less confident, but you know, it's only next year, so we know most of the things that are gonna happen at this point for next year. Once you start to get beyond that, now you're making assumptions upon assumptions and things really start to um, escalate when you just start applying simple inflationary factors on them. And um, as you can see in 21, 22, potentially we'd be facing budget cuts um, because the unassigned fund balance would drop below 6%. Again, that's three school years away at this point and that's typically how the forecast will look on the far out years, uh, just because you're using so many assumptions. Um, just something um, else to um, uh, note in there, again, um, the, the biggest line item, of course, is salaries, and so it's really going to depend on not knowing how we're going to settle out our two largest contracts with teachers and principals um, over the next couple of years. So key points to take away, 2% um, we're assuming for state aid. Um, state surplus, surpluses can easily turn into state deficits very quickly. So depending on how the legislature's late leaders deal with that. Um, if they cut taxes, for example, we could quickly, um, their expenses could escalate and they don't have the revenue to support it and uh, we're in um, a tough point again. Uh, as far as pay assumptions, we've put in two and a half percent as talked about, um, but it's hard to say that your biggest line item is going up two and a half percent when you know that your, your revenue side might only be going up two percent. That's why you quickly get to those deficits. And then, um, the 1920 forecast assumes 10 new teachers. That's what we did this year. We stayed pretty close into that assumption. Um, but, and then another key point I just wanted to point out here. Um, we're talking a lot in the facilities task force about potentially opening new school buildings and bringing forward a question for the voters next year. Um, that would impact 22-23 school year. At this point, we're not making any assumptions in there about needing new janitors, new uh, clerical, new principal to staff these uh, buildings. So just note that we're going to have to fine tune some of those assumptions as we go into the future. I will leave it there. Questions? Mr. Schlusner. Earlier, uh, Deborah had said that uh, the last time we had the funding level you had was nine years ago. And you just said that it's been increased 2% a year for the last essentially eight years. So we really haven't been at historic levels of district funding yet. So um, probably what uh, Director Seelinger was referring to is that when you look at an inflation adjusted basis, we have about 9% less buying power than what we did um, back in 2003. So while the actual dollars keep growing, 2%, 2%, 1%, sometimes it didn't grow at all, uh, we haven't gone backwards in the funding formula, but our buying power becomes less and so then we have to keep cutting costs to deal with that. So I, th I think that message is just important for clarity for our <coughs> constituents who often hear that we've had that we've had more money than ever before, and that Correct. may not necessarily be the case. Correct. We've we've had definitely more in dollars. When you look at some of those expenditure budgets approaching 250 million, we haven't had a 250 million dollar general fund budget before. Um, but we can buy less services with those as prices keep going up and salaries keep going up. Ms. Workman? I think the other thing to remember as well is that, yes, we get more money, but some of that is due to our increasing student enrollment as well. That's correct. So it might, might look like, wow, Rochester just got a land, you know, landslide here with dollars, but we also just took in 200 more students and there are costs associated with those too, so. That's a very good point. I, one thing I did want to point out here that um, I didn't mention was back in 15, 2015, we promised the voters we could make it through 2020 without significant budget reductions. Um, where we sit right now, I feel very confident that we 
can keep that promise that we should not have any major adjustments needed through 1920. In fact, the forecast right now is showing maybe we can make it into that sixth year without having to make a major adjustment as well. So we've held up to our end of the bargain um, like we said we would. Well, that's you. an important message too. Other questions, comments? Yeah, I, I just, you know, John, I had to slide up there about the, the transportation. I think, uh, is it this week or next week we are? Thursday, yeah. Yeah, we are going to sit down with them and see if we can um, bring that cost down. And we know we're going to see a pretty large increase um, for sure. We're just trying to make that increase a little bit smaller than what it currently is. Um, it, right now, if you remember, we took out bids for a one-tiered and a two-tiered. Um, the number he's using up there is for a two-tiered system. A one-tiered system would make that number even much larger. Uh, I mean, we probably, when we bring those bids to you, we'll probably also have a conversation about the, the one-tiered system and potential partnership with the city. Um, Right now, it's not looking very favorable that we're going to be able to afford to do that. Uh, and we'll be able to provide you more of the numbers that explains why that's not going to probably be possible. But um, one or more after this meeting this week, and then we can bring the, the bids to you in January to uh, see, let you see exactly where we're at. Thank you. 7.03 approval of school district property taxes payable in 2019. This is an action item. Be it resolved, the school board of independent school district 535, Rochester, Minnesota, being a school district in Olmsted County, Minnesota, that there be and is hereby proposed a levy upon all taxable property in said school district. A new calendar year 2019 school tax for fiscal year 2020 in the amount of $56,012,288.73 as follows. General fund, $43,216,053.99. Community services fund, $3,054,341.19. General debt service fund, $9,741,893.65. For total certified levy of $56,012,288.73. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 7.04, approval of purchase agreement amendment for the sale of the multi-service building. This is a briefing item. Mr. Munoz. Yes, as I've been sharing with you on the weekly update, we ran into a few little roadblocks as we have been working to sell the MSB building, which is on Broadway, and John's going to give us an update on where we're at today. So much like many of the real estate deals I get involved in, they seem to take much longer and things come up that are unexpected along the way. So uh, what we need to do here is extend our purchase agreement with Olmstead Medical Center out another uh, month from November 30th to December 31st. Um, I feel very confident after talking to attorneys yesterday that uh, we can get um, the land replatted um, and approved at the city and then we're ready to close. So actually they were working on the paperwork and they wanted to bring it over to the school district ahead of the holidays here so that um, the school board chair and clerk could get that all signed up um, before we head out for the holidays. So I think we're on track and everything is falling into place, it just, we were working with um, fairway outdoor and really having to maneuver our way through that company to get the right approvals on there and to get the first part of the deal done before we can finish the deal with Olmstead Medical. And, and just a reminder, we, uh, purchase, we the board approved us our purchase of uh, the land just west of our building, the parking lot and the, the grass from fairway and then now we have to get permission from the city to make the parcel that the building sits on a little bit bigger that we're selling to OMC. So that's kind of the final two steps. But uh, it's John's had to uh, do a lot of work on this and work with our legal counsel on this. And the fact that fairways uh, may be potentially changing some management kind of 
prolong this a little bit as well. So, but we're fairly confident that uh, by the end of this month we can have everything done and sell that property. So, so we need to act tonight. Don't yes, I would appreciate I'll give that. This action. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. It's now an action item. Be it resolved that School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the amendment to commercial purchase agreement with Olmstead Medical Center for the sale of the multi-service building located at 10 9 and a half Street, Southeast Rochester, Minnesota. Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes. 7.05 approval of paying agent briefing item mr. Munoz yeah, I'll turn this over to mr. Carlson all right so when we issue bonded debt we have to make provisions for repaying it and uh, typically we've hired US Bank to serve as our paying agent they take the payments from us and then they make sure that it gets forwarded on to all the bondholders uh, through depository trust company uh, earlier this year, we switched our financial advisor to Ellers, and Ellers has a sister company or an affiliate company called Bond Trust Services Corporation. We're actually going to use Bond Services Trust Corporation on the new debt that we just are issuing, the Series 2018A, um, and we are asking that we also uh, pass a resolution to allow Bond Trust Services Corporation to be um, our paying agent for the rest of the debt issues that we have previously uh, set out there and have hired US Bank to do that. This is not an issue of US Bank doing anything wrong or doing anything bad or us not even uh, being satisfied with their services. Um, Bond Trust Services, um, we have confidence that since they work very closely with Ellers that they'll be uh, qualified and do a very good job for us. In some cases, um, they're um, fee will be approximately $25 less per year per issuance. So um, this isn't something that's going to save the day or anything on, on funding, but we think that the relationship will work well. Any questions? And this is a briefing item. Now. Maybe we want to move to action or not? You can let this one sit. I'm yeah. not in a hurry okay. on this one. Yeah, there's no time. You just put on the cassette. Thank you. Thank you. 7.06, approval of Section 115 Employee Benefits Trust. Briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Mr. Carlson will <laughs> also brief us on this So item. the next three are all similarly related, so I'll tell the story one time to make this go a little bit faster. Um, for the last couple of years, I've felt that we've needed a third health plan option, and with that health plan, we needed a qualified high-deductible health plan that include a health savings account. Um, and through that project of trying to figure out all the legal maneuvering and, and to set up the appropriate plan, we also uh, discovered that perhaps instead of entering into contract with yet another vendor to provide services for us, uh, maybe we should do an RFP and see if somebody can do all of the services for us. And so we did find that. We uh, worked with legal counsel as well as um, uh, a consulting firm called Hayes. They did the RFP and found multiple vendors to bring forward to us to choose um, to manage our health reimbursement account, our health savings account, and our flexible spending accounts. And so all three of these items, um, the uh, legal counsel advised that we just bring them forward because it's been many, many years on some of these uh, since uh, the board has seen them and, and uh, the new vendor which uh, we have chosen, Optum, helped rewrite all these documents to make sure they're all current and they're all gonna work the way uh, we want them to. One little thing here in the uh, first item 706, uh, when legal counsel was reviewing the health reimbursement arrangement, the section 115 employees benefit trust, they advised that the district um, actually resign as the current trustee because when that was set up, it was just listed as independent school district 535 they suggested that we actually appoint a named employee. So we've written in the resolution here that Becky Perlick, who generally on a day-to-day -day base basis oversees the plan for us. And then, then we write into the plan that if Becky were no longer here, it would go to the next coordinator of total rewards. If that position wasn't filled, it'd go to the finance director. If that person wasn't here, then there'd be a superintendent. So there's a transition plan all uh, accounted for in this document. And so part of the resolution just says the district's gonna resign then they're gonna appoint Becky Perlick to be the uh, trustee. 
and that we're also going to approve updating the trust agreement uh, effective January 1. So this one you do need action? This one would be helpful. All three of these would actually just so that they're ready to go and signed up and everything good for January 1. Moves to action. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? On favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's now an action item. Be it resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby resign as trustee of the Independent School District 535 Employee Benefit Trust. Be it uh, further resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby appoint Becky Perlick, Coordinator of Total Rewards, as the trustee of the Independent School District 535 Employee Benefits Trust. And be it further resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby hereby approve the updated Section 115 trust agreement with an effective date of January 1st, 2019. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. 7.07. .07. Moved to action. Second. <laughs> I have to read the thing. We just resigned for heaven's sake. <laughs> Still this recovering from that. 7.07 <laughs> approval of health reimbursement <laughs> arrangement <laughs> plan. This is a briefing item. Mr. Munoz. Uh, just one chance. John just said it with the previous agenda <laughs> item. <laughs> yes. Moved to action. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's now an action item. Be it resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the updated health reimbursement arrangement plan with an effective date of January 1st, 2019. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is approved. 7.08. Hold it, Mr. Smith. <laughs> approval of Section 125 Flexible Benefit Plan. Briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Uh, any questions from John on this? Item. Okay. Move approval. Second. It's not an action item yet. That's what you meant. Move the action. Move the action. action. Sorry. Move it to action. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's an action item. Finally. Be it resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the updated Service 125 Fe Flexible Benefit Plan with an effective date of January 1st, 2019. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 7.09, approval. Oh. Hi, John. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Carlson. Nice job. <laughs> and you've kept within your time limit. Much appreciated. 7.09, approval of revisions to the policies and procedures manual. This is a briefing item. This is an information item. No, no a this it's is a, a briefing item. But we can't move it to action right. because it has to say. Right, sorry. I, w I saw Mr. John Carlson, Executive Director of Finance. Know, yeah. But that oh. is actually Ms. It's, Workman. Yeah. Are you doing this one? Too? Am I doing this one? Sure. Um, okay. The first. I'll, I'll start with seven point or 709, the, new, the, the student transportation safety um, policy. There was one very minor change in the language, which is under Roman numeral five, section E, where type two vehicle has been removed. Sorry, type three vehicle has been removed. And I believe type three vehicle were vans. Am I remembering that correctly? Okay. Any questions about this policy? Good. Sorry, I have one. Oh, dang. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, this is there other uh, examples of a policy like this um, that has um, it, this policy just has a lot of what I would consider odd policy things in it because it's talking about. Um, the actual drivers of the vans, and it, it's quite detailed. So does some of this overlap into uh, personnel policies, procedures, but we're just kind of do doing double duty? Is that the, is that the reason why it's so uh, in-depth in terms of the employees of the drivers? Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I wasn't here when this, these were made, but I imagine it's because it's uh, a contracted out services, so I want to specifically spell out expectations. Okay, thank you. And I mean, there there may be some statutory laws too in terms of bus drivers and what 
who they can and can't be. Okay. I'm one who can't be. That's in state statute. Okay, just kidding. Um, so the other policy was um, policy 612.01, and you'll notice that the entire thing is in yellow because it's a new policy, and rather than try and do strikeouts and underlines and everything else, we just redid the policy completely. And by we, I mean, uh, who worked on this? Julie Ruzek and- Is it Carla Bollison? Carla and- and policy committee. Policy, <laughs> policy committee, right. Yeah. So we've had, we've, we've spent a fair amount of time on this. Um, I did have one question that I could not answer, um, so I will pose it here, is this is a development of parent and family engagement plans for Title I. Do we have or will we have a policy for development of parent and family engagement plans, period, for other schools? Because I believe that's in the new SSA requirements at some point. Um, will we have to delve into that? Or I guess it's not, it's not totally clear that if, if this covers all schools from the, from, the, uh, from the title, it looks like it's just Title I. Yes, and that, at the time that we had this policy, it was because it was a federal requirement for right. Title I schools. Um, we'll have to take a closer look at the new SA requirements and okay. see if we can just uh, use the same policy and just take away the Title I piece and just use it district-wide or if right. we have to have a separate right. one. And, and I have not looked into any detail in the ESSA policy or the ESSA requirements to see if there's substantially more things that might need to be included in this. But in as much as we've had a lot of really great information on how important, important family engagement is and community engagement is, I, I think, you know, this should, we, sh we should maybe take a, a pretty close look at that. Okay, questions? Thank you, 7.10, Superintendent Evaluation Summary. This is an information item and I have that information. School board met in closed session last Tuesday, December 4th, in order to complete the annual evaluation of the district superintendent. Earlier this year, Superintendent Munoz asked that his evaluation should be closely tied to the district's universal goals that were officially adopted last August as the foundation of our strategic plan. The board concurred and agreed the evaluation process should provide a strong basis for a dialogue with the superintendent so the board and superintendent would work together in determining the superintendent's goals for the coming year. Three areas assessed by evaluation were promoting educational access and equity, promoting student achievement by engaging and empowering students, and promoting accountability by fulfilling our commitment to students and families and enlisting the community as partners. The board found that the district, under the superintendent's leadership, has demonstrated real commitment in all three areas. District continues to expend significant time and resources to training staff in the field of cultural competency and literacy so our teachers and paraprofessionals can more effectively reach every learner. The district is expanding the ways in which it engages students by offering more project-based classes with direct real-life experiences. We're seeing elementary students involved in areas as different as coding and ballroom dance. Secondary students have options to explore, uh, explore forensic medicine, entrepreneurship, welding, and philosophy, in addition to trigonometry. And students at every level are increasingly being challenged to problem solve and think creatively. The board found the superintendent and the cabinet under his direction consistently stayed abreast of statutes and policies, demonstrated sound fiscal management, and continued the important work of engaging families, community members, and organizations. In addition, Mr. Munoz, was very involved in a number of important initiatives, including Cradle to Career and a nationwide school improvement consortium. The board also found that we, along with the superintendent, have many areas in which we need to improve, and we have our work cut out for us. First, we need to ensure the culture and morale at all our school sites is healthy. While continuing to ensure we address student discipline in an equitable way, every building must be a place where learning takes place in an environment free of disruptions where students and staff are treated with respect. Second, although the agendas of board meetings are often filled with presentations and discussions about contracts and financial matters, we must maintain a laser focus on the academic achievement of our students, consider the kind of data beyond standardized test scores that will inform that focus, and invite our teaching staff to partner in decision making. And we cannot be satisfied with academic achievement until all students 
regardless of demographics, are successful. Finally, effective communication will always be an area in which there is room for improvement. Listening, validating, empowering, and responding will continue to be skills that the superintendent and the board need to hone as they engage with each other, the community, and with staff and students. These are critically important areas, and during our post-evaluation debriefing with the superintendent, the board and Mr. Munoz agreed to continue the discussion about exactly how to express the goals so they are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-limited. We will accomplish this shortly after new board members are seated in January. Thank you. Seven, uh, point 11, closed session for expulsion. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 13D.05, Subdivision 2A3, I make a motion to move into closed session for consideration of educational data and the administration's recommendation with respect to the proposed removal from enrollment of students who are not in compliance with the requirements of Minnesota Statute Section 121A.15. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are at recess at 7.47 p.m. We are reconvened at 7.55 p.m. Trust her. 7.12. Now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. The school board hereby accepts and adopts the facts and conclusions outlined in the notice of proposed expulsion as the basis for its decision. The school board hereby expels the student from the Schools of Independent School District 535 Rochester from December 11, 2018 through December 10, 2019. The superintendent or a designee is directed to mail the following to the student and to the student's parent. Copy of this resolution and a letter stating that the student has been expelled from December 11, 2018 through December 10, 2019, and may apply to resume attending school in the district the first school day after the period of expulsion ends. The superintendent or designee is directed to identify the alternative educational services or special education and related services that are available to the student during the period of expulsion if the student wishes to take advantage of them. The superintendent or a designee is directed to make an electronic report of this expulsion to the Commission of the Minnesota Department of Education within 30 calendar days as required under Minnesota statutes section 121A.53. Be it further resolved that the student is not allowed on any Rochester Public Schools property except for the building to which the student is assigned, nor is the student allowed to participate in any extracurricular school activities during the period of this expulsion. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And this meeting is adjourned at 1211. <laughs> what? Wow. Today is? 1211. Just make sure everybody knows that. Oh and and we are adjourned at 7:56 p.m.